I don't know if any of you folks ever heard of um, Jay Moore, Jonathan Moore. Has anybody heard of Jonathan Moore? Who, you have? Yeah, special guy, right? Recently passed, recently passed. Any folks who are involved or have interested in Seattle's hip hop or hip hop generally needs to do some research. Jonathan Moore, AKA Wordsayer, AKA Jay Moore, is the architect of Seattle hip hop. And he's somebody that I consider to be my big brother. And he passed uh, in April. A very young man, 47 years old. And it's always important to give deference to, to those folks who, who create who you are. And one thing he told me, he was always known for these like really, really fortune cookie type bits of wisdom that were powerful. And, and we were talking, and you know, we, we were talking about my career. I started off as an attorney. And I don't practice law, I, maybe a little bit. Like felonies run in my family like good teeth and height. So, you know, sometimes. But he said, he said, you realize how lucky you are? He said, you get to be professionally you. You get to feed yourself to make a living being you. Wow, that's amazing. Because most people, when, definitely when I was an attorney, I had to wear a monkey suit. I wasn't myself. I hate that stuff. When I was doing other jobs, when I was on the way to that, I wasn't being professionally me. I had that opportunity. That's cool. He said, but along with that privilege comes an obligation, comes a responsibility. And so in my context as a storyteller, the responsibility is that you are going to take those stories wherever you go. People have entrusted you with this story. And you better tell that story with integrity. And that brings me to tonight. I think um, this time of year, it, it always makes me think of, of graduations, liberation from school. I hated school. I, I'm a father. And my son, he asks these questions. And he asks the questions with the precociousness and brilliance of a 10-year-old. That is that things are self-evident to him. The way they are, the way they appear, is the way that they've always been. For example. He, we were talking about cell phones. He wants a cell phone. All his friends got a cell phone. If any of you folks are parents, don't get your kids cell phones this early. It's horrible. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But he was asking me about cell phones. And I was telling him, you know, when I first got a cell phone, his bedtime is about 9 o'clock. I said, when I first got a cell phone, you wouldn't even be able to talk on it. Well, what do you mean? Well, because back in those old days, you didn't talk on the phone before 9 o'clock. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Like you didn't talk, you, you waited, saved all your, your, your smooth talking, love Jones and phone Jones in for nine o'clock at night. I can't talk to you smooth at six o'clock in the evening. I can't do it. So I, my son, man, you, you just wouldn't talk. That's your bedtime. You'd be stuck. And I started talking to him when I went to school in New York City. I said, when I was in New York City, it was either call after 9 o'clock or find somebody who had long distance. What do you mean? Well, before, not all phones were able to call long distance. Y'all remember that, right? There was, like, actually a prestige thing. It was a class thing. Like, you were a status dude if you had long distance and cable. That was big. And I said, that's not the way things have always been. The first story I want to share with you is kind of related to something like that. It's a story about education and specifically about Native people in regards to education. My communities. I get a lot of stories from my communities and they ask me to share. And, but to give a little bit of contextualizing, to give a little bit of decoding to those stories. And so this story is about a young man who, who wanted to go to school. Sounds simple enough. But Native people. My folks, my community, we, we have the lowest graduation rate in the country. That's a matter of empirical data. Everybody knows what empirical means, right? Like good white folks done studied this and said it's true. <laughs> That's in the dictionary. And, and, and when you look at that number, 
Or if you look at anything historically, so say for example in Seattle, there hasn't been a woman mayor since 1926. It's a long time. There's never been a woman of color mayor. And when you see statistics like that, you're left to draw one of two conclusions. You say either that community or that demographic are just inherently reprobate, or they're less than, they're less qualified. They don't know how to do that, or maybe it's not a, a social value that they hold. Well, they just don't wanna have leadership. Women don't want to be in leadership positions. Or alternatively, you say, no, there's very specific obstacles and structures that stand in the way of those things. So in that context of women mayor or women of color mayor, well, there's this thing called childbirth that historically women carry an undue amount of the burden of child rearing and child raising. It's related to land holdings, which historically women were kept from. You have to be independently wealthy to run for office, pretty much. Similarly, with Native people in school, there's a lot of explanations. There's a lot of reasons. And this is the beginning of the story. Um, there was actually this campaign for Native people. The beginnings of Native people's introduction into Western white education was incredibly vicious. It was incredibly violent. It was incredibly savage. What I mean by that is there was this process where Native people were supposed to just die away. We were supposed to go. And there was actually military campaigns that were launched and said, die, please. And then we wouldn't die quick enough. We're, st we're stubborn. Damn it, we're not going to die. So they said, well, we're going we're gonna to kill all your food supplies. We're going to kill 60 million buffalo so you can't eat. Because if you can't eat, you can't live. But that didn't even work because we're pretty industrious and pretty nice with the frying pan. So they said, we got a brilliant idea. If we can't physically kill you, we're going to kill your spirit. And the way we're going to kill your spirit is by taking your children. And we're going to actually literally steal your children from you, your five, six, seven-year-old children. Take them. Never let them be seen by you again. That policy was enacted by the United States government. It was called, uh, the, this is the actual name of the policy. You can look it up. It's Googleable. You can Google it. Um, it was kill the Indian and save the man. And so there was literally 100,000 kids that were kidnapped, taken away. And once they were taken away, their, their parents weren't put in a position where they could, where they could explain it to them because they were just gone. And so now you have this child in a school, in a setting, brick building, look like this. Never been in a building like this. Have no clue where they're at. The first time they ever seen white people in their life. Oh my God, what is this? Except for they didn't say it like that because they didn't speak English. And, and these children, they're wondering why they're away from their parents, their family, their community. They're wondering if they will ever, ever see home again, see their parents. The next thing that happens, and this is really deep, the headmistress or the headmaster, master, excuse me, they would sit them down on a chair. And they would be sitting there, and they'd be looking around because they'd never seen any situation like this. They'd never seen all these incredibly pale people that they have no context for. And then these people would cut their hair. Now, within many communities, including my community, cutting hair, the first cutting is a sign of mourning. And so these kids think that somebody died. One of their family members died. They're wondering, who died? And there's nobody to explain it to them. But even if they were to explain it to them, they wouldn't understand because they don't speak English. And the headmasters, masters, and the headmistresses don't speak their native language. And so they're just there wondering, man, why am I not at home? Why am I, why am I there to, to, to be around my family? And it caused, this is a matter of record, deep existential pain. 
what we refer to now as trauma. And there's studies, there's a lot of studies, another part of that empirical data that says it both, uh, there's a sister by the name of Rachel Yehuda who's done research on the descendants of the survivors of the Holocaust and found that the way that survivors of the Holocaust deal with stress actually changed their DNA. Moreover, there's a, a brother, Cambodian brother by the name of Lim Kiyuki who did research with the descendants of the survivors of the Khmer Rouge and found that their DNA had likewise changed. They had trauma. They freaked out situations. Moreover, it caused physical effects. Their rates of diabetes are the highest in the nation because the way they process insulin. So that experience, I suppose, had a, because we're talking about school, and we're talking about native students graduating at lower numbers than anybody else in the nation. And if we just look at the statistic, we'll say, oh my God, these kids are just inherently reprobate, right? Like they just can't do the work. Just like women can't be mayors or presidents or because there's no obstacles in the way. This is just the way they are. And this story is about a particularly precocious student by the name of Manny. Scene. An Indian student in the classroom, sitting quietly at his desk, filling out his application to Harvard with a pen, writing and dreaming big dreams of success. Twelfth grade teacher stands in the back of the room, arms crossed, head down in distress. Silence for half an hour before the professor began to profess. <clears throat> she cleared her throat. Manny, Manuel, <laughs> I've given this a lot of thought. Are you sure you want to go through with this? You're applying to a school with literally only a few spots divided amongst hundreds of thousands of applicants. Do you really think you have a shot? Her question suggested her answer. She thought that this was all for naught. Plus, she wanted to leave the school before 5 o'clock. She didn't think that he could make it, despite the lessons that she herself taught, despite his work ethic and perseverance that she seems to have forgot. Manny was familiar with the statistics. He has heard them quite a lot. People telling him no since he was little. He was well aware that Harvard was a long shot. Hell, he was a long shot. He wasn't supposed to be here. Public education was a crock, but he was here. He thought again about her question smiled at her and answered her. Can I make it? Sure, why not? <sighs> she exhaled loudly, cut her eyes. Fine, but please finish up soon. I have a lot of students' homework to grade this afternoon. Manny, how would you even pay for such a school? You weren't born with a silver spoon. Your mom makes minimum wage. Your dad's long gone. He robbed a local greasy spoon. Even if your solid grades and personal statements make the admissions committee swoon, would you even be able to go? Manny had a pretty good idea of what this teacher thought. He grinned at her and answered her, thank you so much for that food for thought, but I don't worry about the school saying no. My mom had nothing. Having less than nothing does not mean a whole lot. She would have loved a rejection letter from an Ivy League school, some little sign that Indian people weren't completely forgot that rejection letter is a sign of progress. If that's the worst prospect that I've got, then I'm doing pretty good, dear teacher. Indian kids aren't supposed to have squat, especially when we're raised by single mothers. We're not even supposed to have a piss-filled pot, but I have my mom, my school and soon a diploma. I'd say that I have quite a lot, plus the audacity to expect more than just a menial job and three hots and a cot. I demand more on behalf of all my people who wanted to dream but simply could not. They were starving, stolen from their parents, sick, and or simply trying not to get shot. My life is an ideal, but I don't have any of those worries. So even if I don't get one of those coveted Harvard slots, I promise I'll be plotting how to make even more opportunity. So I thank you for staying with me past five o'clock. 